Jacob got a promise from Esau that the birthright belongs to him. But uh, Jacob's not finished yet. When Isaac is very old and mostly blind, the time comes for him to give the eldest his blessing. He tells Esau, go hunt some wild game and make some of that savory food I love and bring it to me to eat and I'll give you my blessing. Rebecca overhears the whole thing. As soon as Esau goes off hunting, she calls Jacob over, go to the flock and get me two young goats. I'll make some stew, you bring it to him, and he can bless you before he dies. Jacob says, Mom, I'm nothing like my brother. It'll never work. What if he touches my hand? What if he gets angry and gives me a curse instead of a blessing? Rebecca says, Upon me be your curse, do what I say. So Jacob brings back the two goat kids. Rebecca makes a stew, dresses Jacob in Esau's finest clothing, and wraps the goat skins from the recently killed goats around Jacob's hands and neck. Esau must have been one hairy guy. <laughs> Jacob brings the stew to Isaac, and he says, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you have told me. Isaac is suspicious. How did you find game so quickly? Because the Lord God granted me success. Let me feel your skin. And Isaac does. He's confused. It sounds like Jacob, but the skin feels like Esau, and the clothes smell like Esau. Are you really Esau? I am. And Isaac gives Jacob the blessing from God. You will have great prosperity. Nations will bow down to you. Your brother will bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you, and blessed be everyone who blesses you. As soon as Jacob is out of there, Esau arrives too late. Isaac is sorrowful. He didn't mean to do it. Esau is outraged. Esau begs and demands a blessing from his father. Make it right. Make it right. The only blessing Isaac can give is a harsh one. You will live by the sword in a rugged place and serve your brother, but you shall break the yoke from your neck. Well, that does seem to describe Esau's life, but it especially refers to their future nations. In the time of King David, Israel ruled the Edomites. Jacob's descendants ruled Esau's descendants. But later on in the time of the kings, the Edomites successfully rebelled. By the time of Jesus, you've got King Herod, an Edomite, ruling over Israel. So King Herod is a descendant of Esau. Make that connection. And King Herod, of course, gets supplanted by Jesus, the descendant of Jacob, whose kingdom is not of this world. This carries all the way forward. Esau is furious. He makes it clear that the moment Isaac is dead, Jacob is a dead man. Rebecca tells Jacob, go, get away from here. Stay with my brother Laban and lay low. I'll send word when it's safe to come home. Then Rebecca goes to Isaac and says, it's time Jacob got married. What if we send him north to my family to find a wife? We can't have him marrying any of those awful Hittite women. He can marry one of my brother Laban's daughters. Isaac agrees and sends Jacob away to find a wife. There's the curse. Rebecca never sees her beloved son again. She, she messed up. Isaac and Rebecca die and are buried in Abraham's tomb at Hebron. Was, was this the way God wanted to give Jacob the birthright? No. No, this is the way Jacob made it happen. God promised Rebecca back when her babies were in her womb, that the younger would inherit the blessing. And yet Rebecca and Jacob felt the need to scheme for it, to move God's promise along to make it happen on their terms. This is very much like uh, last week when Sarah gave her maidservant Hagar to Abraham so he could have a baby. They were all just trying to, you know, help God's promise come to pass, to move God's promise along, to make it all happen on their terms, because, boy, they were sick of waiting. And they brought great suffering on themselves because they hurt each other. They committed violence against each other. They broke God's law. God's plan for our life 
is better than our plan for our life. And God is far more patient than we are. Cooperating with God's plan very often involves simply waiting and doing the good things in front of us he has given us to do while we wait to inherit the promise. Jacob, he's in trouble. He's sent away from his family. He's never going to see his parents again. He's not going to see Esau again for 20 years. Then it seems he only sees him once. Not only that, but inexplicably, Isaac and Rebekah send Jacob off to find a wife without giving him any money. When Abraham sent his servant up north to find a bride for Isaac, the servant brought along ten camels and loads of expensive jewelry to give away. Back in that time and place, the man needed to pay the woman's family a bride price if he wanted to marry. And a good bride commanded a good bride price. Jacob is empty-handed. Was Jacob running for his life in that big a hurry? Was Isaac a stingy or negligent father? Was Jacob robbed on the road? We have no idea. All we know is that Jacob shows up to find a wife empty-handed. He's not going to get very far. Jacob on the road is alone, penniless, and desperate. He stops at Bethel, where Abraham built his first altar in the land of Canaan. He finds a stone for a pillow and sleeps out under the stars. And there, he dreams of a stairway to heaven. He sees angels climbing up and down between heaven and earth. And God speaks and says, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham and Isaac. I will give this land to you and to your descendants and by you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And I am with you. I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. Now, you're asking, so when does Jacob get punished for what he did to, Is for what he did to Esau? First and foremost, we see God's mercy. There is not even a hint of rebuke in his words to Jacob anywhere. What does that mean? That means Jacob knows he's screwed up. He's gotten himself ejected from the family. He's on the run. God comes to him when he's at his lowest and says, you are still blessed. And not because you uh, tricked your father out of the blessing and demanded it. You are still blessed because I am still with you. I still have a plan for you. And I will protect you wherever you go. That's how God deals with us too. Tender mercy especially when we've messed up. A bruised reed he will not break. Why the angels going up and down on the staircase? The angels show Jacob God's activity in the world. God is active. His messengers are everywhere, carrying out his commands. Jacob needs to know that God is still at work in the world and in his life. God's in control. You don't have to worry about it, Jacob. Think of the Tower of Babel earlier in Genesis. Man schemes to build a tower to God. But God shows Jacob, look at this. I am already deeply involved with you and with all of humanity. I have sent angels to help you. You don't build a tower to me. I build a bridge to you. Traditionally, the stairway to heaven is an allegory for Jesus, the ultimate bridge between heaven and earth. What else? There's so much going on here. Um, God shows up when we least expect it. He's always there. He can show up at any time. I love how here God chooses to show up to Jacob in his sleep. Jacob, when he's awake, is full of plots and plans and doing things his own way and second guessing. God bypasses all of Jacob's defenses. Visiting him in his sleep and leaving him with an experience he can't argue with. What is Jacob's response to this experience when he wakes up? First, wonder. Surely God is in this place and I did not know it. How awesome is this place? This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Second, worship. He takes the stone he used for a pillow, sets it up as a kind of pillar and pours oil over it as an act of worship. And third, bargaining. God, if you really are with me, if you really do keep me safe and give me food and clothing and bring me home in peace, 
then you shall be my God. This place will be your house, and I will give you 10% of everything I own. When our defenses are down, when, uh, when our ego has been kicked out of the way, we experience God in wonder and worship. When our defenses start to go back up, we second guess everything. We doubt. We rationalize. We bargain. Jacob is spiritually awake. He has a relationship with God. But here, it's an immature one. He's still burdened with doubt. If you really do everything you say, then you shall be my God. And he's also burdened with the notion that he has to earn God's love and pay him back. You do good things for me, and I promise I'll do good things for you. Jacob has yet to grasp that God is grace. He's not like these pagan gods that demand a quid pro quo. You know, you, you want rain, you got to do the rain sacrifice. God doesn't need us to perform for him. God doesn't need our help. God wants us to accept his mercy with open arms. God wants to give us complete trust and complete faith. God wants us to relax and be completely secure in his love, like a little child on his mother's lap. We can stop worrying about how we're not good enough and how we skipped our prayer time and how, oh man, I shouldn't have said that. And, oh, I don't think I can get all the stuff I need to get done done today. And all the little ways we feel like we continually mess up. Jacob messes up. He messes up big time. God was with him anyway. When we mess up, just look up. God carries us like a parent carries their child. We reach our arms up. He lifts us up and gathers us to himself. It's in our weaknesses that we get to experience God's tender love and help and strength.